Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Climate Governance Initiative is the country chapter of the World Economic Forum's Climate Governance Initiative, first in Asia and second in the world. Recognition that businesses are facing real physical risks and behind an evolving regulatory landscape. So there is growing urgency on the need for companies to understand, assess, and disclose their physical climate risks and opportunities. Investors are already demanding hard targets. When will you have commitments? When are you going to get to a position where your emissions are going to be known to us? How are you measuring your emissions? By which year? And how are you going to set, get to the targets that you have cited? What's the capex that you're going to deploy? Are you going to be accredited? They need a pathway to clearly demonstrate this. But businesses are also increasingly recognizing that changing consumer preferences and new climate policies are creating the greatest commercial opportunity of our time. These investors are calling for credible transition plans from all companies and clarifying those expectations with emerging best practice being publishing plans that include scope one, two, and ideally scope three targets, balancing absolute emissions with appropriate offsets, governing the management of those risks at the board level, and tying executive compensation to their achievement. Transition plans are going to reveal leaders and laggards on the road. But rather than having authorities be overly prescriptive, we're looking at investors having a say on this transition to establish a critical link between responsibility, accountability and sustainability. We also need an all of government and all of society approach to climate risk. Paris was a tremendous breakthrough, but when we're doing the math with new climate modeling, we're getting to 2.8 degrees of warming and not everyone is meeting their Paris commitments. So we need to do better than Paris. And there has been some encouraging signs, especially recently, there's 126 governments that have now committed to net zero, including the global giants, China, Japan and South Korea. But we have 12 months to go to the next COP in Glasgow in November next year. There's an opportunity for us. We should be looking at taking concrete steps to build resilience, to identify physical risks, to adjust to new stakeholder expectations, to meet the changing needs and demands of customers and clients as they respond to the impacts of climate change. So Climate Governance Malaysia is planning to engage closely with all of government to see how we can collectively increase our climate ambition. I hope we can involve all of society, including every single one of you, in this important conversation so that we can mainstream our understanding of the climate crisis. For today, on her birthday, no less, a very, very happy birthday and God bless you with a long and happy and healthy life. I am delighted to introduce Tansri Dr. Jamila Mahmood, who is no stranger to any of us. She is a renowned humanitarian. We were very pleased to hear of her recent appointment as the first Asian senior fellow <laughs> of the Arsh Rockefeller Center at the Atlantic Council where she will be working with global experts on strategies to increase climate resilience of 1 billion people at climate risk by 2030. Back at home, you will all know, she's also the special advisor to the Prime Minister on Public Health <coughs> and a member of the Economic Action Council and is actively engaged in the COVID-19 response. Thank you so much, Sansri. Prior to this, she was the Under Secretary General for Partnerships at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, IFRC, in January until June this year. Her other international positions include being the Chief of the World Humanitarian Summit at the UN in New York, Chief of the Humanitarian Response Branch at the United Nations Population Fund. She is, in short, an accomplished humanitarian and also well known as the founder of Mercy Malaysia, operating globally. Her dedication and commitment to humanitarian work has naturally extended into concern and alarm over the impending humanitarian crisis arising in this region from the climate emergency. We are all looking forward to hearing from her. After her keynote, we are also very pleased to have with us Datuk Sri Johan to engage with Tansri Jamila in a conversation and to take all of your questions. Datuk Sri Johan has over 35 years of experience in auditing, business advisory and corporate governance. He has just been appointed to the Securities Commission's Audit Oversight Board. He is currently a board member at the Institute of Corporate Directors Malaysia and has sat on the board of three listed companies. A chartered accountant, Johan had previously served as the Executive Chairman of Pricewaterhouse Malaysia. So now 
It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Tansri Dr. Jamila Mahmoud and invite her to give us our keynote. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sri Sunita. Uh, Salam alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, it's such a pleasure uh, to be invited to speak at this important and timely event. And congratulations to Climate Governance Malaysia for really trying to bring forward some of these very important issues. I must warn you, however, that I am in no way a corporate leader nor an academic. And so rather than try to convince you uh, of the importance of the seismic shifts <clears throat> that are taking place in our world today through presenting hard evidence and facts, I'd like to assume that you have been sufficiently awake over just the last 12 months to understand that. But maybe a few reminders are in order. Last Saturday night, was the hottest on record in Sydney, Australia. This is less than a year after the horrific bushfires that burned down 186,000 square kilometers of territory. If you need that contextualized to the size of Peninsula Malaysia, it's 500, uh, sorry, 50,000 square kilometers smaller at 132,000 square kilometers. Now, some 900 million metric tons of carbon were released into the atmosphere. Again, for context, Malaysia released a total of 258 million tons in the whole of 2018, somewhere around a third of the emissions caused by the bushfires. On the other side of the planet, 2020 is shaping to be the most active hurricane season on record, with 29 named storms causing misery once again for the inhabitants of the Gulf of Mexico. The five most active years on records have been 2020, 2005, 1933, 2012, 2011. Basically, four out of five of them have happened in the last 15 years. So there are two headline grabbers. They matter because they demonstrate that there is an underlying trend here. The world is getting hotter, but this year at least, we are in the grip of something far more immediate, COVID-19. Having recently transitioned from my role at the IFRC to supporting the country on public health at such a challenging time, has been a really sobering experience for me. COVID-19 has shone a very bright light on the fragility of society. Happily, humanity has risen to the challenge despite some very significant political challenges. A vaccine, several in fact, are close to being available and there is hope that we can get back to some kind of normality. Even while we are still in the grip of this pandemic, we need to think really carefully about what normality will look like. Climate change remains a terrifying prospect. The very brief respite in carbon emissions generated by the decrease in the economic activity hasn't had any impact on warming. The economic rebound post-pandemic will, in all likelihood, negate all the positive gains made in carbon emission reduction. Ladies and gentlemen, when we look at the facts, why are we not in the same state of panic about climate change as we have been about COVID-19? Academics argue because outbreak and pandemic and any of a dozen of high stakes words accompanying this pandemic dispatches deadliness, and thus it's not surprising, nor ill-advised that the media and financial markets respond with alarm to COVID-19. If so, then it is high time that we switch our language to truly represent the climate situation now, a climate crisis, an emergency, desperate for immediate attention. Climate change is too passive a description for a catastrophe to humanity that is already well underway. 
But I'm also aware that our massive and fairly well-coordinated response leaves scientists, environmental advocates, and long-view money managers imploring where is the impetus for moving on policy change and market-driven fixes, solutions to carbon st- to store carbon, for instance, to limit a future environmental health crisis, one on par with or even greater than the coronavirus. When I was researching some of the facts and figures included in my comments today, it struck me that I had to dig fairly deep to find information. Conversely, COVID-19 is pretty much headline news every day and has been now for the best part of a year. Headline-grabbing news often has its roots in politics. What politicians do and how they behave determines what the news features. But politicians' behavior is usually, but not always, just usually, determined by the public. If politicians make the electorate's life more difficult, it reduces their popularity and ability to govern, and in democracies, their chances of being re-elected even if the imposition of discomfort now is designed to deliver incalculable benefits for the future. If that electorate is unable to assimilate the threats emanating from the future, and this is proven to be psychologically very difficult, then political behavior and related regulations will not change and resilience will not increase. The threats from the future are both real and multiple. A quick scan shows us that Malaysia and the ASEAN region are threatened by current COVID pandemic, a clear and present danger, and one which has consumed a huge amount of political, economic, and social energy this year. Irregular migration for economic reasons. I wrote last week in the Star about the links between our current surge in cases and economic migration. Rapid and disorderly urbanization, where people are moving to cities to improve their economic prospects. Cities emit more carbon than rural locations, place greater strain on supply chains, and are generally fairly inefficient places to move around in. Displacement due to factors other than conflict, forest fires, floods, shifting weather patterns. The growth in the number of refugees and generated both by ASEAN states as well as people seeking asylum in ASEAN member states, is another pressure. The unresolved situation in Myanmar directly impacts us, but far less than it has Bangladesh, a country facing devastating consequences from sea level rise. Environmental degradation and related water scarcity, unemployment, especially for young people who are the future, but what sort of future will they inherit from us? as well as the social, political, (coughs) economic disruptions that will be wrought as the world learns to live, work, travel, and manage risks in a COVID-19 environment. Now, I painted these as future threats, but they are not. They are with us now, and their consequences are seeping into our daily lives. There is no loud bang as there has been with COVID-19, but they are here and they are affecting us already. A slightly longer term view into what also brings into sharp focus the existential threat of climate change and related transboundary haze, forest fires, droughts, floods, and other events often wrongly described as natural disasters, which are in fact a result of human activity Combine these with the ongoing natural hazard and disaster threats, such as earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes that exist in countries around us, like Indonesia, Philippines, and Myanmar, and my sense is that our readiness is left horribly wanting. Ladies and gentlemen, let me summarize my argument thus far. Global threats are real, and they are happening now, not in the future anymore. COVID-19 has proven to be such an immediate threat that we have worked fairly well to address it as a collective. So there are lessons to be learned. COVID-19 has also distracted us from the broader set of issues that threaten our way of life and quite possibly our meaningful survival 
on this planet. Politicians respond to pressure from their populations. Populations find it hard to assimilate and react to hazy and poorly articulated future threats, although there is traction. Progress on reaching in a meaningful way to global threats, and especially climate change, is therefore slower than it should and must be. The missing piece in this equation is business. Business drives our presence on this planet, but in the face of the climate crisis, it's almost like a zero-sum game. Businesses can choose to either be proactive, recognize the risks and mitigate the impact in time, or come unprepared and merely approach the unmitigated risks reactively. But like politicians, businesses react to changes in behavior by the electorate, the customers and clients in this context. So we have politicians and businesses adopting the same behaviors which are in their short-term interests but not in the people's longer-term interests. I thought it would be interesting to demonstrate what I mean through sales of electric cars. A quick search online revealed the following figures of new electric car sales in 2019. China registered just over 1 million e-vehicles on the road, new ones, in the USA, the number was 320,000. For the whole of Europe, it was just under half a million. For South Korea, around 30,000. I checked two ASEAN countries, the largest one and most populous, Indonesia, with 24 new sales. And here in Malaysia, which I was pretty sure would be somewhere between Indonesia and South Korea, and I was right, Eight more new fully electric cars were sold in Malaysia than in Indonesia last year, a total of 32. My conclusion here is that the political and economic drivers to gear up for electric cars is massive in China. It is directly related to the population's air pollution exposure and related concerns and an aggressive government campaign to get people to switch. It's the same in the U.S., despite rather than because of the politics of the incumbent administration. Whereas here we are, an oil-producing nation, petrol extremely cheap by comparison, and consequentially, there appears to be limited political or economic appetite for change, despite rising air pollution in our cities and a general understanding that the switch must be made at some point. So it's encouraging to read that Petronas has recently announced its ambitions on net carbon, net zero carbon emissions uh, by 2050. I haven't checked on the eight other ASEAN member states or nine, but even so, it's clear to me that we are lagging far behind other developed nations and developed parts of the world when it comes to addressing the causes of climate change such as use of the internal combustion engine. At the moment, there is still a need for a common definition for businesses to evaluate what economic activities count as environmentally friendly or disruptive, and if such classification should be extended to the overall business operations. Some businesses are, after all, concerned about coming across as only greenwashing, with little or no actual environmental impact, a concern that is guided by the right motivations. Fortunately, Bank Negara Malaysia has outlined the five guiding principles to support classification of business activities towards climate risk mitigation. But what is more important is that for some level of understanding and conversations to trickle down to the board levels where actual decisions occur for the businesses. This also means that we need the decision-relevant data for companies to systematically identify climate risks and, importantly, for the risks to be defined in physical and transitional terms. In the future, when we look back at this pandemic and how it was dealt globally, it becomes a story 
of good governance and strong leadership. This is also the story that is being drafted now in the wake of the climate crisis, as we see more regional focus brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, it is a prime opportunity for ASEAN to take the lead in building climate resilience for this regional society of about 600 million people. So what can we do? Let me put forward a few thoughts that we can perhaps pick up um, in the question and answer sessions. Firstly, I've learned through my many years as a humanitarian uh, in the system of the humanitarian system, and more latterly working here in Malaysia, that pandemics, disasters, and crises don't respect borders. I'm sorry if it sounds cliche and so obvious, but it needs to be made to reinforce my point that while I am first and foremost a proud Malaysian, I am also a proud internationalist. I fervently believe that humanity can no longer look at this sort of crisis and challenges that we see today and in the future threats that we will, we will all experience through nationalist windows. I realize that this may be somewhat of an, of a, of a fashion, out of fashion position to take, but the facts speak for themselves. COVID-19, climate change, water scarcity, Irregular migration, cross-border displacement, all of these and more will disrupt our borders and the way in which our world is so comf in, the, in the way that our world is so comfortably organized. Secondly, of course, during mankind's history, there has been some recognition of this, some effort to join together in the face of threats from the other. Malaysia is a nation of federal states. So is the USA. Indonesia is a highly decentralized nation, but is a nation. The European Union has survived since just after the Second World War, and the United States of America remains united since 1776. The United Nations just turned 75, and no matter how much we lambast it, we know that deep down, it does a great deal to protect our peace and security, even if that work is sometimes invisible. And in our record, in our region, ASEAN has assumed an increasingly significant role since its creation in the late 1960s as a regional peace and security guarantor and more besides. Oftentimes, we think about ASEAN cooperation and we tend to look back at the ASEAN way of consultation, quiet diplomacy, consensus-based decision-making, and the all-prevailing non-interference principle. But the climate crisis, by definition, is a risk looking forward, not backwards, and needs a new engagement strategy between member states. Our governments, central banks, and major leaders themselves have not traditionally dealt with climate change and environment. And which is why moving forward, it does require a lot of rethinking. And in more extreme cases, discarding our flawed norms. Thus, thirdly, when we look at the challenges that climate change alone presents, my sense is that our regional architecture is found wanting. The 10 ASEAN member states vest neither sufficient resources nor authority to act to the ASEAN Secretariat or the bodies that have been created over the years. There are ways that the climate talks in the region can be strengthened besides just the traditional pillars of the ASEAN way. The ASEAN Defence Ministers Plus, for example, focus more on non-traditional security concerns where climate-related issues should be very high on the agenda. The ASEAN minus X formula can and should be extended to fast track and bypass the consensus decision making system. As we have seen with this current pandemic, no issue lives in isolation. The climate crisis is an environmental issue, a health issue, a humanitarian issue, an economic issue, as much as it is a security issue. The September 2020 edition of the ASEAN magazine was pretty much entirely devoted to climate change. 
an article confirming that ASEAN is bearing the brunt of climate change was spot on, stating climate change is a complex multifaceted issue. And in spite of the extensive efforts at local, national and regional level, it's still happening in a rapid and alarming rate in the ASEAN region. Addressing the challenge adequately will require innovative, coordinated solutions that everyone should be a part of, from public and private sector, civil society, youth, women, to every single one of us. There are opportunities to enhance knowledge exchange, technologies, capacity building, awareness raising, and behavioral change to contribute to the transformation necessary to combat the climate crisis. And I agree with this. Climate change is everyone's business. And so I read the conclusions of the article with some dismay. Fully recognizing the need to act with greater urgency to respond to the climate change crisis, ASEAN is committed to further enhancing its collaborative actions on climate change with partners and stakeholders to facilitate the development of comprehensive and coherent regional response to climate change challenges. Pretty general plaudits and not very specific, nor remotely action oriented. But then, without the authority from member states to do and say more, what more can we expect or even hope for? Fourthly, there is a need for sectors to come together. ASEAN is actually perfectly configured for this. Its secretariat is composed of three pillars, all of which should be working in full synergy to address the regional challenges that we face from climate change and other future threats. The political security pillar of the association should be fully engaged in predictive analysis of how regional security may be impacted by the multifaceted challenges that climate change related events will generate for the region and presenting these to leaders and citizens alike. The economic pillar of ASEAN should be visibly working with you, the business community, at future-proofing regional businesses, promoting the use of electric vehicles, actively moving to find ways for regional cooperation on renewable energy generation. And here, we are lamentable given our access to solar and wind energies across the region and retooling our economic base for the future. And the social cultural pillar should be working with civil society organizations to help prepare them and the people of ASEAN for what we are facing now and will face in the future. But these are difficult issues compounded by a stovepiped way of working by the ASEAN Secretariat. No clear incentives for tighter interpillar coordination and an overly controlling council of permanent representatives and no great sense of urgency by the member states that we need to get a move on. Ladies and gentlemen, Malaysian businesses are the powerhouse of our economy. Perhaps it is now time for those same businesses to look beyond our borders and see how they can responsibly engage at the regional level to assist ASEAN in becoming the regional force for change that I don't see emanating easily from anywhere else in our corner of the planet. In other contexts, I have proposed a council of the wise to help entities work through complex problems. I think that it's time that such a body was proposed to the ASEAN member states. So maybe Malaysian businesses working with our government and businesses of other countries in this uh, region could consider proposing the establishment of such a council, which would be an independent body mandated by the heads of state to horizon scan macro threats and challenges posed by climate change, health, urbanization, natural disasters, and other socioeconomic factors, layers with the ASEAN Working Group on Climate Change and other climate and disaster related bodies, review and propose improvements to ASEAN's political and operational systems and architecture to address these threats, and finally remain as a permanent advisory body to ASEAN on ongoing implementation and review for selected disaster and crisis-related issues. Of course, this is not going to be easy, but climate and other threats are real and increasingly imminent. 
Our region is lagging and full of, frankly, false promises and empty declarations. We must act. We must act together. And we must act now, no matter how exhausted we are by the last 10 months. Imagine if we found out that an asteroid is on course to reach Earth. Surely governments worldwide would collectively push the panic button, perhaps even faster than what was done for COVID-19, and efforts would immediately be mobilized, research into ways to deflect the asteroid away from Earth, coordination to move people from the high-risk areas into safer zones, and immediate communication of what this means to societies. How is it then that we are not pushing the same panic button in the context of the climate crisis. In closing, I remind you of this cartoon that did the rounds back at the start of, COVID of the COVID-19 crisis, where two scientists are standing with a clipboard looking at the graph with a small blip on it representing the pandemic. One of them is saying, I'll be glad when this is over. The next photo, or the slide, shows that the graph stretches behind them, where there is a huge wave tsunami labeled climate change, and it's bearing down on them behind their backs. The accompanying narrative calls on all of us to flatten the curve, the climate crisis curve. Talk is easy, action is slow, often with the most compelling arguments and excuses, in fact, to avoid it. To put it simply, as the UN Secretary General, when launching the State of the Planet report, I believe yesterday, the state of the planet is broken. We need to fix it. No one else. Are you with me? Thank you very much, Sunita. And well, Johan. <laughs> <laughs> well, Asalaamu Alaikum and very good, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are tuning in. Thank you, Jamila. Let me add my thanks uh, and welcome for, for today and for um, giving this very scary sort of outlook to us. If I could just uh, uh, try to encapsulate what you've, uh, what you've said uh, thus far. Uh, COVID-19, it's, it's a global threat, but it's just a small blip compared to what is coming. Climate change, climate emergency is way, way worse and is existential. And when you talk about... Um, people, the population, the customers just can't get our minds around a forward threat like that until it's actually smashing down on us. And therefore, uh, politicians, therefore, sort of mirror that. And what is kind of worse is that you lump business in with politicians. Now, we in business, uh, company people, we're not used to that. You know, we're used to <laughs> sort of thinking of ourselves as a bit more strategic, but we're uh, you're saying we're, we're not. Uh, climate change, well, it's not a forward thing. It is actually here and affecting us now. And, and business, well, has this massive role. We can either be proactive or reactive. And if we are reactive, well, by the time we actually act, it may be too late. Um, then you turn your, your thoughts to ASEAN and how ASEAN states could actually uh, do, do a great job. But there, thus far, we are not. Uh, ASEAN is not doing that because partly because of the way ASEAN is set up. And perhaps ASEAN is not set up in a way to, uh, to, be act to, to take on something like this in a proactive uh, manner. You mentioned Petronas has set a um, 2050s of net-net, I think they call it, um, uh, target. Uh, well, why not ASEAN, you ask, and why not ASEAN countries? Um, at least then you, you're suggesting how about a council of the wise to, to scan the, the, the horizons and to recommend action and to actually lead uh, in action. And actually what you say is collective action in ASEAN kind of thing may be easier to trigger than individual governments. Maybe, maybe ASEAN first, then the governments may, may follow. I hope I've kind of captured what you've said in a, in a few in a minute. Uh, in your excellent keynotes. Thank you very much. Um, Q&A. We are now in a Q&A session. <laughs> and um, uh, the organizers, the excellent organizers at Islamic Rockets will be feeding to me the questions that come from the floor. But if I may uh, use my privileged position to, to kick off 
uh, fancy Jimmy, uh, Dr. Jem, as I, as I call you, I'm sorry, I just can't, can't change. Dr. Jem, you know, uh, one of the reactions in countries like ASEAN countries, because we are each individually very small, is that, uh, yeah, we are small. What can we do? It's the big countries out there that need to take the lead. Uh, China, India, uh, European Union, uh, and US, they're the ones that should take the lead. Well, guess what? Joe Biden has won the US presidential election. He will soon be president of the United States. He has said that the US will go back into the Paris Accord. Wait, surely our troubles are over. We can sit back and they can do all the heavy lifting and we just carry on like, uh, buying our 25 cars a year. Is that the answer, Joe Biden, <laughs> big countries? Thank you, Johan. I think, uh, yes, uh, the Biden administration has, uh, you know, really outlined climate change as one of its top priorities, which is great. Uh, and coming back to the Paris Agreement and, you know, this ambitious two trillion climate action plan. But I think it doesn't, you know, mean absolute victory and an immediate end to climate action for these three challenges. I would call the three C's. Um, the, pol- the climate, the political climate, uh, Biden is coming to overturn ideas and tone set, um, and reverse Trump's, uh, backtracking. But let's be realistic. The political uh, environment in the U.S. is in crisis. Um, uh, the U.S. society is more polarized than ever. And while the American people can rally behind the climate initiative, uh, ambitious plans will likely trigger more polarization. So, um, you know, even during the Obama administration, I believe that uh, even legislation that was proposed to dramatically cut the uh, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050, failed uh, to actually pass the Senate. The second C, probably in the U.S., that's relevant is Congress. Um, and and you know, climate-friendly Biden is actually uh, under the influence of uh, the Republican control, Republican-controlled Senate, um, where coal reigns under the Dems. Um, uh, Dems, uh, Democrats win. Um, anyway, congressional approval will depend uh, on Democratic support. Uh, who are uh, more likely to vote on climate issues, but probably having only a very narrow margin with the House of Representatives. And the third is cabinet, right? Personnel is policy. So I think that Biden's climate plan understands the interdisciplinary factor of the climate crisis and how it really depends and is representative of the broader issue of social justice. So who he chooses now to put in his cabinet will be key. Um, I think the good news is that the climate crisis is a popular topic among the young people in America, and in fact, the rest of the world, and they are known to be vocal, especially on social media. Uh, this could act as a, a really strong check and balance, I think, for the Biden administration's implementation of, of the climate plan. But the U.S. Is, is, is complex, right? So we are saying that, you know, if it goes to plan, and I doubt it will go easily to plan, it does not stop smaller countries like ours to also get our act together. Right. Okay. So uh, as far as the U.S. status is concerned, it's, it's complicated. And, uh, and, uh, and we have to, we have to act. Okay. Uh, we've got to act. Um, then you, you mentioned Petronas having this 2050 uh, target date for net net. Now, 2050 seems to be the magic uh, year because you've got, I believe, you've got the uh, United Kingdom, France, um, Denmark, New Zealand, all, or New Zealand, I think very, very recently, all the other day have, uh, um, have announced also the same 2050 date. Uh, of course, wanting to, you know, Scotland has to be better than UK, so... Um, uh, Scotland has gone for 2045, and I believe Sweden has as well. And I think a lot of countries are starting to enact legislation for this 2050. Kind of begs the question. Um, I'm not a citizen of ASEAN. Uh, I'm a citizen of Malaysia. Um, what about Malaysia? What about my own country and my own government? What are the likelihood? And, and how, could, um, how could our own country move towards at least setting the target? Because once you set the target, then things will fall into place. Yeah. 
I think this is a really important question, uh, Dr. Johan. Or Johan, I, I don't, I don't claim that I can speak uh, for the government, uh, but it is certainly one of the probably the most critical issues I would like to discuss with the Prime Minister when I find that time. Now, let's go back to how we might make this real, right? If you look at COVID-19, the COVID-19 did not happen in a vacuum. It happened because of, you know, many of us, and, and when I say us, it's nations, all of us are citizens of the world, you know, violating our planetary boundaries and damaging the environment. Uh, you know, climate change uh, has happened because it's, uh, you know, we, of the anthropocenic effect, uh, you know, that, that has, um, has occurred. So I think that if we even uh, look at, you know, how do we prepare ourselves for future crises, including potentially more pandemics uh, down the road, we have to look at, you know, how we protect those planetary boundaries again and try to basically heal the world. Right? It sounds very corny, but it's true. Um, but and I think that you you can do that by setting in place commitments and then policies that follow. Um, I know I've been speaking to uh, the Ministry of uh, Environment here uh, and a few other important stakeholders in government who feel the same way that this is something we need to move towards. I think the, you know, the, the space will arise where we need to do that. And I think even looking at our budget, uh, when we're looking even at sustainability as one of the elements of uh, the budget, I think it sends already a signal that we, start to, we need to start looking at some targets for ourselves. Right. Um, there are a few questions that are starting to come in now from the, the audience. And just by looking at the audience, I, I, I feel it's quite a varied crowd. I mean, there, there are um, the corporate people inside, also some NGO types. And mm -hmm. I'd like to ask on sort of, you know, what would be the advice that you give to the NGO community on this kind of thing? You know, is it uh, go it alone, companies go it alone, NGO go it alone? head-to-head uh, -head, or is, is a cooperation possible in this kind of sphere or is it just not not going to happen like that? Yeah, I think the NGO community is is critical uh, in raising their voice uh, and advocacy uh, and I think this has been really quite phenomenal in moving the COP agenda uh, and uh, you know all of us uh, re recall what Greta Thunberg has done but in reality, there are many, many, many unknown Greta Thunbergs in the world who've been working even before her, really driving the, you know, the, the climate uh, crisis uh, dialogues. And I think this has to continue. And I really hope and I, I, I call out and salute the, my NGO friends who have really persisted. And I just say, stay loud or even louder, stay strong. But beyond advocacy for, for things to really happen, right? For concrete action to happen. I think that the activist community has to look into, uh, supplementing large companies with innovative solutions. Partnership is key. Simple, quick, cost effective solutions that might escape the corporate's, uh, more ambitious thinking. Uh, a large opportunity is to also gamify our understanding of climate risks. Right? Keep it interactive. Keep it personal. Uh, I always say to my NGO friends, corporate leaders have children too, many of them your age. So, you know, if you influence uh, your community, they influence their families, and I think that's very important. And of course, for the private sector, they need to create that space for this to happen, invite uh, the, the uh, NGOs. And CSR should not mean anything more than social responsibility and not just... Um, you know, whitewashing it. I think it needs proper engagement and interaction, and not just lame policies that you put on your website, you know, make yourself feel good, uh, but don't really translate uh, into listening. I think the NGO community could be demanding to be heard more, and I think they need that space. Uh, and, you know, there's some I think there's some really good examples around the world that we can look at, you know, things like the, I don't know if you know, the BGBG initiative. Uh, it's a social enterprise working on innovative solutions for sustainable fashion. You know, you even have, you know, all sorts of uh, other initiatives like the Green School in Bali and all that. You know, these are really 
uh, good examples and really how can the NGO community start infusing the business community with some good ideas? Well, well good ideas are, are yeah, great. T- taking that a little bit further, mm-hmm. um, a question coming from the floor. Given that Malaysia and ASEAN are leading in the fintech space, so we're doing well yeah. there, how, is it time to push for climate tech and make Malaysia a hub in, in that kind of technology? Absolutely. I think so. I think that, uh, I mean, look, uh, in, in the business sector, obviously, there are guidance from Bank Negara, uh, you know, uh, recent, uh, on how you actually um, have responsible and sustainable financing. There's been a really interesting RFI report recently, Responsible Finance uh, Institute uh, report. Um, on the climate tech, you know, I would really encourage whoever is, is asking this question, um, you know, to, to try to get into, you know, the innovation sandbox and places like that where that you could get some seed capital to start doing a lot of the design thinking and, and figuring out how you can make this happen. Uh, because, you know, the innovation must be on systems. And I think climate tech is really a systemic approach to to, to addressing this. So yes, I would highly encourage that. And why not Malaysia be the, you know, the base for this? Um, well, wow, questions are sort of pouring in now. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. And another thing that kind of you, you used to work in, in uh, simulation when you touch upon education, for example, yeah. is it time when you talk about the young, you know, um, uh, and Greta and all that. Is it time yeah. to include the subject of climate change as a mandatory subject in our education system? Absolutely. I think so. That's the way to start. Um, you know, not just education as in curriculum, but, you know, how does a school build in the ideas of sustainability and climate awareness uh, into the everyday things that it does? For example, simple things like recycling like um you know an urban urban farm a urban garden a food garden in the school um you know about uh you know what you do when you go home i i say a lot about this about home is because having worked in many of the crises around the world when we want to talk about you know for example retrofitted buildings for earthquake areas we always do demonstrations to children because when they go home they tell their parents they want a safe house and they want it to be, you know, uh, retrofitted. So I think, you know, if, if you look at, I'll take the Japanese example of how school children know exactly what to do if there is a tremor. Uh, we need to have, you know, uh, build a culture into among school children that they know exactly what to do to protect the climate. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Kate Rayworth's uh, Donut Economics. And if, if you ever have a chance to see a film called 2040 that is done by Damon Gano and features Kate, um, you will see that in some cities, they've already started to install inside the schools um, the carbon footprint. OK, uh, and, and, and at a personal level as well, I mean, on my cell phone, I have an app called Capture where I actually track um, uh, my carbon footprint as well and I can offset. So, you know, it's about a real education, not just in terms of uh, curriculum, but also our own social behaviors and our own um, cultures and, and bringing that in so it becomes real. Changing gears slightly, um, sort of back to the uh, two things really, back to the um, the economics and back to the business side of it. I recall the previous Minister of Environment saying in a in a forum, uh, you know, we, we really need to work on this climate change, um, but don't worry, you know, we won't like burden you. I I, I think she was. Hoping to not scare the corporates, you know, and, uh, you know, they won't have to spend any money on it. Um, you know, we can do it almost without you noticing it. Uh, you know, is, is that really possible? You know, is, is this, um, is this a forlorn hope? You know, surely it's going to change the life of everybody and it's going to change companies as well, isn't it? 
I, I, I would love to know who this minister was because I'd really like to have a conversation with her since you say it to her. But I think that, you know, how do we make, sh- how do we make it very clear, uh, if it's not already clear, and I don't understand why it's not clear because the evidence is all there, that it makes good business sense to invest in sustainability on so many fronts. I think those listening on this webinar will probably know much more than me that you know, climate risk is, uh, is real and that uh, your future investors also demand from you uh, to have sustainable businesses. Um, and I think we've seen this a lot in all the, you know, understanding what young people's priorities are and your future workforce. Uh, there's a very strong demand for, you know, a, a business that is sustainable and working with employers that, you know, are climate sensitive and, and will do something in their in their corporations. So the return of investment is very, very clear. I think we've seen businesses that have become green uh, and, and become more profitable. So it's a matter of now political will, uh, so to speak, from the board of directors. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think we we have to drive this message continually that we are in a crisis mode. Just as you want to have business continuity in, the, in light of the pandemic, you need to start thinking about business continuity in light of the climate emergency. Okay. Um, business community, you know, is made up of, as you say, board of directors. There's probably not too many on the call, but there might be a lot of people who work in companies mm-hmm. on the call, and they might be in middle management or even uh, top management. Uh, okay, I'm a middle manager. I'm, <laughs> I'm really scared about what you're telling me uh, today, uh, Tansi Jamila. And I, but but you know, later on tomorrow, I'm going back to the office, and it's life as usual. And CEO, well, CEO expects to be around statistically for probably the next four years or something, uh, five years if she is lucky. Um, so what does this lady do when she goes back to work? How can she, how can she push it up onto the agenda? What arguments perhaps can she use? You mentioned ROI, for example. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think it's about you know focusing on 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 changing expectations, as I mentioned before, right? It used to be that corporate leaders didn't need to worry about climate change or or climate emergencies. Um, and uh, you know, corporate leaders uh, or even corp- staff can help their companies by you know, supplying this leadership, right? Really, you know, they need to do more than what they're doing because whatever they're doing is good, doing more for their communities, more for their nation, more. For, and what does, you know, what does your company brand uh, mean? You know, how do you align that with what your customers also value? Because if they don't, then probably the company uh, may be at risk, right? And I think that, you know, I think we have to be very clear about terminology as well. I think with with the corporates, right? There's the climate emergency that is here, uh, and there's also demand for climate resilience. I think this is the theme of our webinar. I think really it's for them to realize that, you know, climate risk, there's only a, a, a fixed amount of risks out there. And then, um, and whether it manifests into physical risk really depends on other variables, right? That will put us at higher risk. But, you know, but climate resilience is about, you know, uh, about looking at the longer term sustainability of the, 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 the business and also, uh, sustainability of the environment. And I think that, um, you know, uh, it's not, I don't see why it's not about a no risk or no risk choice for companies to make. They either are proactive and find ways to mitigate the impact of this risk, um, or they can become unprepared and reactive and face the full uh, brunt of uh, unmitigated risk. So I think, you know, that that is how we need to 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 sell it to them, right? And and I think that you know. I, I want to quote what Larry Fink, BlackRock, uh, was saying um, earlier this year. And he said, there is no question in my mind that the frequency of events um, is giving us real evidence that climate change is investment risk. So, you know, no company should be surprised at how this is evolving uh, and changing. So we're going to see a s- seismic reallocation of capital. So I think that's how, you know, larger corporations certainly uh, need to look at it. So, you know, if if I was working uh, with a chairman who didn't understand it, I think also, and I think this is where the multi-pronged approach 
bringing the real stories, right, of, of what is happening uh, in climate change and how that impacts your business. I saw this wonderful map um, of Malaysia's coastal, uh, Selangor, in fact, coastal region um, uh, and um, the water level, sea water levels uh, by 2050. And you'll see that, you know, a very significant portion of the, the coastal region of Selangor will be underwater. And, and I remember, uh, you know, uh, EPF uh, showing a diagram and locating their offices on that map. So no doubt, you know, there will be some mitigating factors uh, that will um, maybe lessen the impact of the seawater water rise. But the reality is that they recognize that some of their offices are going to be underwater. So that's how real it is. So how do you make it real for for corporate leaders and, you know, to to accept that the climate risk is very, very severe? Uh, it's here. And, and what do you now need to do to take action? Well, that's that's pretty stark, actually. I, I recall a, a map, similar map in the UK, and uh, and I think the authorities there were, were sort of saying, well, we'll save the big city that's in that map, but the smaller villages and towns, tough luck. We just can't afford to save, you know, to build a wall that can save everything. And you guys, well, your property, a tough luck, really. You know, that yeah. that may and interfere. I suppose the values of those properties will, will just be gone. Let me let me share with you, Johan, uh, a conversation I had with uh, um, Anote Tong. Uh, Anote Tong was a former premier of Kiribati, uh, one of the Pacific Islands, and he was telling me the story how they have rented land in Fiji and have started to move their ancestral artifacts to Fiji because uh, Kiribati will one day be completely underwater. So there are countries, we're not even talking about uh, corporations, there are small Pacific Island countries that are buying land uh, around their region to basically be prepared to become climate refugees. So, you know, so will that nation even exist because they're in another country? And that's how real and how stark it is. Um, and, you know, will that happen? Uh, more and more, yes. Uh, you, in our region alone, in Asia, you're looking at um, Maldives. Uh, in Malaysia itself, I think if we map enough, there will be a number of uh, islands that will be underwater. Uh, same thing with Indonesia and others. Jakarta is having uh, to move its capital because it recognizes it may be underwater in not too distant a future. So this, these are all real issues. Um. Uh, changing gear slightly, um, in terms of our lifestyles, can we, so here's a question from the floor, um, can we change our, do we need to change our diets? Uh, because, you know, do animals, uh, cows, what have you, you know, chickens, all, do they take up too much land and uh, emit too much uh, emissions? Uh, and should we be going vegetarian? Um, Johan? I'm going to ask you, how much water do you think uh, is needed to produce one quarter pounder burger? I have no idea. <laughs> you know I have no idea. Hazard a guess. How many litres of water? <laughs> I don't know. Two, three? Oh, no, no. A quarter pounder. No, it'll be a lot more because of the cow and all that, right? So, uh, I don't know. 20? It's 5,000 litres. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your, that, that is a, a very important question. It sounds simple. Uh, it's for that reason that I have now stopped eating red meat for uh, more than a year. Um, and I plant my own vegetables at home. I consume more vegetables than anything else. Uh, I've become more pes pescatarian and I have an ambition to be vegetarian, but I, I'm doing it slowly. So the, the answer is absolutely yes. And look at the companies that have now uh, moved to non-meat products, right? You see Beyond Meat, uh, Nestle as well has started to look into non-meat uh, um, supplements. So it has also become a big business. So the, the answer is absolutely yes. I think we just have to cut down our red meat consumption. And if you can't, you, you don't have to be vegetarian, but it can start with, you know, building a habit in your families that perhaps you have a meatless Monday, uh, and then slowly adding meatless Wednesday. Uh, so then build that habit so that you start 
uh, you know, moving towards less um, meat consumption. Right. Okay, I, I, okay, I've got a lot of questions here, and they're kind of the same thing. Actually, returning to government, how mm-hmm. to, you know, what can we do? Basically, I'm trying to encapsulate them all. What can we do basically to um, to, to to raise awareness so that uh, policies uh, get put in place to address climate issues. I think we have a, I got five or six questions here, basically yeah. on that on that subject. I know you touched upon it earlier. Yeah. Please, again, what can we do? Keep it simple, right? What do we want? What do we want is number one. We want advocacy, so we have to keep our voices high and loud uh, in the right places, in the right chambers. Find the champions in government that will do it. I believe me, there are many champions in the in government. Who believe very uh, strongly about you know the impact of the climate the crisis that is, is upon us right now. Uh, the secondly is we need to create more avenues for dialogues like this. I think this is a really excellent opportunity. We've got to have more. Uh, but we also, as I said, keep it simple. Come up with you know simple matrices on what the government can do. What is it that business can do? What is it that civil society can do? And then you know not just uh, you know. Uh, presenting as well what each each component of society can offer. Uh, and fourthly, I think, you know, we've got to start uh, telling some stories. I think start, you know, certain pilots, certain things that uh, we can do to demonstrate the impact and the and the benefit of that. And, and I think, uh, you know, I think we've just got to keep raising our voice. And uh, once, and I can tell you that right now with, with COVID and everything, um, you know, there's a lot of distractions right now, but uh, there's me and a couple of people in government right now who are very determined to raise this issue uh, to the right channels to say, can we start thinking about this? This is the next, or rather it's already upon us now. Even though we have a pandemic, it doesn't mean the climate crisis takes a pause. It's still there and trying to demonstrate those waves. And there's so much in it for us, you know, that if we really protect the environment and really, you know, put in very strong policies on climate, uh, on, on, on climate, um, resilience, uh, we will actually improve our economy. Uh, if you think about, you know, investors wanting to have, uh, in, put, put in investments in, in companies or businesses that have more of ESG, uh, you know, and about, how we could actually build a whole ecosystem around ecotourism because we have one of the most biodiverse uh, countries uh, in the world. So I think we've just got to persevere, and I think that it will happen. You know, I, I'm an incurable optimist because uh, I've seen how, you know, getting the right conversations in the right place sometimes moves things, uh, and, and I can assure you there are many people uh, who, who feel very strongly about this. Okay, last question. Last question. From, um, this is from the floor. I don't, I don't know who sent me this question, so it's all anonymous to me. Uh, but good one. Taking from your last point, you talked about cause for optimism. I'm smiling because I'm trying to keep it good. Um, some people think it's too late. Do you think we still have time to make a difference and kind of Soothe the way, whatever it is. You know, that's what the words are. But you know, make a difference and and save the day. I don't have a crystal ball in front of me to tell you whether it's absolutely too late or not. But I always believe it's never too late to do something. We've seen in the last 10, 11 months how COVID-19 has really reduced the amount of carbon in the environment. Um, and I think that should be a wake-up call for us. And I think that if we can all commit to, to, to working towards this, we may not – the end the end point – or rather, the, the the point of no return may push be pushed further. So that's the hope, right? I don't think you can bring it back to normality, but bring you know delaying um, you know that that end point, as I said, you know where where things just go completely out of control. So um, it's it's very easy to sit back and you know sort of say, oh, it's just too late. But I think we've just got to keep working on it because I think that. Um, with the U.S. now on board, you know, with China also being on board, you know, and we just have to keep going. I think that that's the only thing I will I will say. Well, well thank you. I'm I'm gonna uh, our time 
Tansu Jumeirah has um, together has sadly sort of come to an end. Um, I had this nice thing written, you know. <laughs> I prepared my wrap up, but, but you are kind of the ideal um, keynote speaker, and because you can cover a huge, wide whatever I throw you, you got to you know you have an interest and you've read a book and you you know the person you've met the person kind of thing. So how to wrap you up is almost impossible. But I suppose let me let me tr- attempt. Uh, you brought to us the kind of wide nature of this problem, the climate change and becoming climate crisis and climate emergency, that um, it is going to affect all of us. That is actually is here and now. It's not a future uh, thing. We as the population, as the customers, and we as some of us may be government types, but we also as business people have got to be proactive and not reactive. Because when you're reactive, uh, we could end up uh, just it, basically, it's too late, and the that that last wave that you showed in your cartoon may come crashing down, wipe us um, wipe us all out. Um, corporate leaders, there's messages to you that uh, you got to be leaders, really. Uh, you, you can't be followers. Of, oh, all the other companies are doing it now. I'm going to do it. Uh, that's why people like BlackRock, you know, they really are leaders. People like Petronas, they really are leaders. We all have to step up and do that, no matter how big and how small the company is, I think you're talking about. As individual people, um, well, NGOs, let's say, let's start with them. NGOs, there is a model to, to push companies. There's also a model to work with companies and help them and show them, you know, the way. So probably different ways of knocking on the door and bashing on the door at the same time. Um, lifestyle when it comes to us as individuals uh let's push for our kids to you know to to be inculcated with a culture of sustainability from school not just the curriculum but everything they see and do around them and you know don't eat don't eat uh quarter pounders and for god's sake don't eat big macs sir. that's do <laughs> eat like you were sir. um and you know and for everybody um advocate keep your voices high and loud it is basically not too late. And in the words of, you mentioned her, the most famous 16-year-old in the world, um, Greta Thunberg, she said, I'm speaking on behalf of all our kids and all our chuchu and all that. We deserve a safe future and we demand a safe future. Is that really too much to ask? Thank you very much, Tansi Jamila. Happy birthday. <laughs> I hand back to you. That is Sri uh, Sunita. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sri Johan, and thank you so much, Tan Sri Dr. Jamila. Um, w- the words that you have shared with us today, I'm sure, is going to be resounding in a lot of people's minds, and this recording is going to be available on the Islamic Markets website as well. So um, any of our viewers or people who didn't manage to catch it today, they'll be able to listen to it over and over again. So to summarize, yes, we recognize climate change is everyone's business. And if Malaysian businesses are the powerhouse of our economy, how can they responsibly engage at the regional level to assist ASEAN in becoming the regional force for change? I loved your suggestion of a council of the wise, which I hope will be proposed to the ASEAN member states. I love that you'll bring up net zero emissions target with the prime minister and you have been engaging with multiple ministries. So to summarize, we're entering the decisive decade of humanity. We need to make the journey of a multi-decade transition that's deeply complicated. And a key insight that we already have is that whether or not we succeed in delivering the Paris Climate Agreement is no longer just about decarbonizing the world's energy system, but it's equally important to maintain our biodiversity, transform the world's food system, and maintain the carbon sinks that we have in the natural ecosystems. Because you can't have a successful business on a dead planet, so we know that environmental sustainability and commercial sustainability are one and the same thing. What does success look like? I think we're all hoping that we want to mainstream the climate conversation. We've got to have some sort of pathway to mandatory. We need a language that's understandable and accurate and simple enough to work with people on the street, so to speak. Make sure that money is being invested consistent with the transition and we need to ensure that we have carbon offset projects as well. So once again, thank you so much, Sanjay. Uh It's been fantastic having you here. We really appreciate this and uh, look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you. And thank you, thank Dr. Sujo. Bye-bye. Bye.